Ladies and gentlemen, we move on to this leadership keynote, Scaling and Transforming Organizations. And our keynote speaker is Mr. Nikesh Arora, Chairman and CEO of Palo Alto Networks. He's going to be live with us uh, from California. Mr. Nikesh Arora is the Chairman and CEO of Palo Alto Networks. And uh, he joined as the Chairman and CEO of Palo Alto Networks in June 2018. Before joining Palo Alto Networks, Mr. Nikesh served as the President and Chief Operating Officer of SoftBank Group Corporation. Today we are privileged to have with us Mr. Nikesh joining us live from California. And uh, we also have with us, as you can see, Mr. Harish Agarwal, partner ENY India, moderating for this session. A very warm welcome to both of you, and I hand over the session to Mr. Harish and Mr. Nikesh. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Tina. Uh, good morning, everybody, again, uh, people who are in the room. And good evening, Nikesh. Uh, it's, it's pretty late, I think, nearly 10 p.m., I would imagine, in the Bay Area. So thank you for joining us this late. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll set the context, uh, Nikesh, and if, uh, you know, I'll ask you a few questions if, if you're okay. I think uh, you know, the last three, four years have been quite tumultuous. Uh, the earlier speaker, one of the earlier speakers, you know, Amitabh spoke about the VUCA world, how we had three years ago when we had the Infocom, we the, the, the theme was the VUCA world, and then obviously COVID-19 happened. But if I was to look at the last five years or six years, you know, even before the pandemic, we had a lot of uncertainty in the global markets, economically, technologically, changing consumer tastes. You know, the supply chains got uh, reconfigured before the pandemic, and then after, obviously after the pandemic, we had huge uh, deficiencies in the in the in the in the supply chain. We've had a huge war on talent. We've had the Great Resignation, which is now, I think, coming under control. So I think with with all of these, Nikesh, my first question to you was, how do uh, best business leaders like yourselves manage through such disruptions? Well, first of all, Arish, thank you very much for having me, and everyone, thank you for allowing me to do this on Zoom. Um, you're right. Look, we've gone through a lot of changes, I would say. Uh, I think I would posit that disruption is a constant. There's always something going on that leaders have to embrace, whether it's you know, at a, at a global level, whether it's a pandemic or a potential recession coming up or supply chain constraints, or at a micro level within your own companies or whether it's in your own market. So there's always something that we have to deal with as leaders. And part of the opportunity here, part of the challenge is you've got to figure out how do you embrace it and are you constantly adapting your strategy depending on what new information shows up. Now, the, as you appreciate, the challenge is we have about 14,000 people who work at Palo Alto Networks now they're expecting strong, consistent direction and leadership because you can't make them get buffeted by everything that happens every morning. If they wake up in the morning, they hear there's a supply chain crisis, do we change our strategy? Tomorrow they hear there's a pandemic, what do you do? So our jobs as leaders is to find a way of both having a very strongly articulated vision and North Star to our teams, at the same time being nimble enough to be able to make sure that you're adapting the strategy. The team needs to hear certainty. So the challenge is our job is to take all that uncertainty, find a way of creating certainty for our teams. It's our job to embrace that disruption or that constant change and find a way that we can give reasonably clear, consistent, longer term direction to our teams because teams cannot change every day, every week, every month and say, well, we're gonna do this today, we're gonna do that tomorrow. When you start doing that, you create way more disruption internally, don't get up, end up getting any outcomes. So I think part of the opportunity and challenge, as I said, is for us to embrace that disruption, find a way of creating certainty for our teams, whilst trying to internalize that uncertainty ourselves as leaders and, and chart a clear path. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Nikesh. Uh, just continuing on the same thread, uh, you know, obviously the need for cybersecurity went up significantly in the last two or three years. So on, on the one hand, we had shortage in supply, and in your case, the demand went up significantly. So, you know, a company like yours, Palo Alto Networks, how did, you know, you personally guide your company through these disruptions? You know, it'll be great for, for our audience to hear some of those steps that you took. Well, first of all, let's give some context, right? So for those of you who don't know Palo Alto Networks, we are the largest cybersecurity company in the world. We employ about 14,000 people. We operate in 150 countries and we're about a $50 billion market cap public company today. Um, 
And as part of our opportunity, our job is to secure both nation states around the world as well as corporations around the world from potential cyber threats and cyber attacks. Now, what happened is at the beginning of the pandemic, as you rightfully said, you know, we all went online. Everything shut down. You know, you didn't have stores. People had inventory stuck in stores. The only thing that was working was online. So and the entire focus of the business became, if online doesn't work, our business is not going to work. And that put a lot of pressure on technology departments. I think that actually accelerated the adoption of technology by two or three years because everybody had to make everything work on their mobile phones, on their laptops. We all had to engage in you know, touchless behavior. Everything was being transacted in every part of the world using technology. Now, when that, that was one effect. The other effect was everybody started working from home. So you have suddenly a situation where we would go to work, we were working in our offices, and you had to secure the campus or secure the office buildings. But today, you have to secure every employee sitting at every one of their homes. So in our industry, we call that the explosion of the attack surface. I'm no longer restricted to office buildings or offices or data centers. I am now in every employee's home because I'm supposed to protect every every edge of the network that effectively is where you're accessing technology from. In case you're offering that capability to all of your customers, I have to be in everybody's customer's home to make sure that they don't get attacked or hacked, which might cause my systems to get attacked. So in that context, you know, that was, those are the things that were happening from a technology perspective. As you said, the demand was going up. At the same time, we had ourselves to deal with. We had employees who just woke up one morning or told, don't come to work for the next four weeks. That's where it started. You know, Apple announced, Palo Alto announced, you announced, for the next four weeks, you are going to work from home. And they never came back for two years. So what that did, not just from a technological level, that put a tremendous amount of uncertainty in our employees' minds. And the challenge was, you know, we are, I firmly believe that if you have uncertain employees, if you have people who are nervous, they don't do their best work. If you want their teams to do their best work, you have to provide them certainty, as we talked about. So me and our management team embarked in this program called FlexWork, and we went out and told our employees, we are going to create uncertain, we are going to create certainty for you. Nobody is going to lose their job at Palo Alto Networks. Come what may in the pandemic, we, the management team, are standing behind you. We will give you the certainty. You make sure your families are safe. You make sure you're comfortable where you are. You make sure you can deal with the pandemic from an economic, from a health perspective, we'll make sure that your employment is secured. That small act went a very long way in our journey of trying to become the largest cybersecurity company. We had one of the most dedicated, focused set of employees because they knew their job was to come every day and get their stuff done, come as in show up virtually on Zoom or whichever platform that they were choosing to work with us on, whether it was Teams or WebEx, or they were talking to customers. And that sort of went a very long way, coupled with the fact that so suddenly, you know, cybersecurity demand went up because technology demand went up. So we're in, we're effectively a correlated demand function based on how technically adept aware your infrastructure is becoming. So from both those perspectives, you know, we had to create certainty for our teams. We have to increase our productivity whilst working remotely. And at the same time, we had to make sure that our customers were getting what they need. And I think long story short, in the last three years, we've been able to double our business and we're now slated to do about $7 billion in revenue. And about the beginning of the pandemic, we did about two and a half, give or take. Thank you, Nikesh. Uh, uh, looking forward, I think, you know, obviously Palo, Net Palo Alto Networks came out, you know, much stronger through the, uh, through the pandemic, you know, and, and, and like you mentioned, I think, you know, you kept your employees charged up and, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, provided great service to your customers. But now heading in, there is a stock of, you know, at best, you know, a soft landing in the U.S., maybe a hard landing, you know, so there's talks of recession to a great recession. You know, how are you equipping your company and, you know, keeping your employees charged up as you look look into the next 12 to 18 months? Harish, that's a great question. I don't think, you know, I don't know if you, know, you guys are paying attention, but earlier this uh, morning in the U.S., uh, the Federal Reserve came out and said that they think that the interest rate hikes may have to slow down or we may get a lower hike in December. So markets are feeling a bit calmer. But having said that, you know, we're not out of the economic pressures around the world. Natural gas and oil are still very expensive. You know, people may have forgotten there's still a war going on between Russia and Ukraine. So, 
by all means, there's lots of macroeconomic uncertainty, which is coupled with the increased oil price, coupled with the supply chain crisis we went through, coupled with full employment in the U.S., there's a tremendous amount of inflationary pressure. So the Federal Reserve in the U.S. is trying to bring inflation down. You're seeing the dollar get very strong, which has a global impact from an import-export imbalance perspective. So there's a whole bunch of macroeconomic activity. How that is translating itself is it's creating uncertain demand uncertainty in the world. We haven't had demand uncertainty in the last two or three years because the U.S. was flush with cash. Everybody was flush with cash. They weren't traveling. They were spending money. So I know that India has a slightly different you know, set of outcomes because uh, India did not go through the pressures, some of the pressures the U.S. went through. But having said that, there's too much money that flooded the market. So inflation is becoming a problem. Now, because of everything that the Federal Reserve is doing, we're all talking about potential recession in various parts of the world, whether it's because of you know, high inflation in Europe because of gas prices, or it's because of the war in Ukraine, or it's because of the, the Federal Reserve increasing interest rates. I think this is yet another form of uncertainty, right? Now we have demand uncertainty, we have economic uncertainty. I think for the first time in many years, we've seen tech companies around the world say we're going to slow down hiring. We actually heard of a lot of tech companies saying we're going to shrink our workforce because we may not need as much employment given that we're going to have these demand pressures. So this is a different kind of uncertainty. We're pulling out the same playbook we had at the beginning of the pandemic. We're trying to create certainty for our employees. We're trying to create certainty for employees. At the same time, you know, it's a different macroeconomic environment, which means we have to go out there and increase our sales activity. The good news is technology demand is not going to abate. You know, the, we're all, all, all going to end up getting more and more technically deployed around the world. Still, there's a lot of technical debt in the world that needs to be paid. So a lot of companies have to spend a lot of time and effort in building up more technology, which means our demand is not going away in the cybersecurity business. However, because there's economic pressures, you know, purchasing cycles will slow down, people will spend more time thinking about things, people will spend more time analyzing things, which means you just have to be better prepared. We have to have more precise value added capability to share with our customers. So we just have to increase the activity of our business on the front line. We have to make sure that we're closer to our customer. We have to make sure that we're deploying in a much more flawless fashion. And we have to make sure we create certainty for our employees. So that's what we're going to be doing. And I mean, to be honest, I don't think that that downward cycle is over yet. I think we still have six to nine months of this to deal with until we reach a point of stability from which hopefully we can build again. Thanks, Nikesh. And, you know, we in India also hope that, you know, we, the U.S. comes with a soft landing because in India we always get the impact with a lag. Uh, you know, so if, if the yeah. U.S. gets out of it quickly, then, you know, we'd, we'd be spared it. So, so thank you for that. Uh, moving on, one of our earlier speakers touched about, you know, Web 3.0 or the metaverse. And, you know, we are talking about increasing complexity uh, geopolitically. Uh, and you are mentioning that the need for cybersecurity would keep growing. At the same time, you know, uh, technology is evolving. How do you, uh, you know, and, and then there is this talent shortage. So how do you, how does your company, how does Palo Alto Network recruit, retain talent? Uh, you know, Harish, that's a great question. Look, uh, I think India has built a phenomenal capability and capacity in technologically savvy, uh, technology savvy workforce. Now, given the the demographics in India, hopefully we can keep training people in India to be more and more technically capable, which should be able to at least solve the problem for not just for India, for many of the countries that are served by Indian companies. So that's a good thing. Uh, having said that, I think in the end of the day, you're going to see more and more adoption of technology in every company. So it, you know, I personally believe a lot of businesses are tech businesses. Is a financial services institution a financial services company or is it a tech company because just moving bits and bytes? So you're going to see more and more technology adopted everywhere. Uh, we had a real problem uh, in Silicon Valley about six or nine months ago because we were at full employment. And what happened is people were changing jobs pretty fast. They were changing jobs in six to 12 months. They were looking for greener pastures every six to 12 months. Now, the good news is anybody who wants to work in cybersecurity, given what we've been able to achieve the last five years, wants to work at Palo Alto. And it's always nice to be the largest company in the space and the most desirable company, in which case you get a little bit of the brand benefit that people want to come work for you. That doesn't mean they don't want competitive wages. That doesn't mean you know, people who work for you are on the lookout for their next big opportunity because they see 
everybody's hiring, there are a lot of jobs open. And that was the case about six to nine months ago. Towards that end, you know, our brand, our culture, and what we've been able to achieve helped us. I think that is also changing. I think the demand is slowing down for talent, as in, you know, we were past full employment in Silicon Valley, which means there are more jobs and less people. I think that is stabilizing. I think that's going to stabilize more. Perhaps you know, we might see you know, less jobs open in the next six to nine months, as we talked about. Um, so hopefully that will stabilize things. But again, the only way any company can manage in a, in a situation where there's a talent war and attrition war is going to be through their brand and through making sure that you take care of employees. Uh, thank, thank you, Nikesh. Uh, my next question is, you know, there's been a lot of startup activity and now we are seeing that these startups are also obviously, some of these startups have started to start gasping for funds. Is this going to lead into a next round of consolidation in the, in the, in the cyber security, uh, you know, companies in that whole environment? So, you know, it's interesting, uh, and I had the privilege of, as you know, investing in a various startups in India many years ago, and obviously keep tabs on the Indian market as well as, you know, I live in Silicon Valley, so it's all around us. And I think the euphoria had gotten way ahead of the actual reality in the world. I think, you know, companies were being formed and they were racing to billion dollar valuations everywhere in the world, and we were all boasting how many unicorns are being created every six months in every part of the world. And I know I'm as sure as you probably subscribe to this, you know, I've always felt in India, uh, we've always been a bit more balanced about letting companies run away with valuation than we perhaps have been in the West. But I was beginning to see that some of that, I think, infectious optimism was reaching India as well, because we were also talking about unicorns in India. So I think it's a good thing. I think this is called the great digestion. You talked about the great resignation. I think we're going through the great digestion. People had forgotten that startups have a probability of failure, which is very often higher than the probability of success. You know, um, if you look at the venture capital industry for the last 40 years, approximately 1% to 2% 2 of the companies actually make it a unicorn status, right? You're lucky in 5% of the companies if you can't even get your money back, and you lose your money in 93% of the companies that you invest in. We've kind of forgotten that. You know, we were celebrating every company that was being created and everybody thought, every entrepreneur thought, hey, I can go out, start a company, three to four years from now, I'll take it public, you know, and I'll retire with a house and pick your favorite, you know, holiday city, perhaps Goa for people in India and perhaps you know, Hawaii for people here. So I think that euphoria, that, that, that excitement has balanced down. Even then, though, I don't think we've still reached the point where entrepreneurs have reset their minds to the new reality because they still have fresh from their last funding rounds, they still have some cash in the bank. So to your point, I think the gasping has not started yet. Uh, they can see that there may be shortness of breath as they go up the hill, but the gasping has not happened. I think we need to get through that moment where people realize that they need to have real business plans, they need to have real path to profitability, they need to have real visibility into how to generate cash flows. At that point in time, they will have a choice. They will have a choice of going to the market and raising money at perhaps what is a lot lower valuation than they had, that is if investors believe they have a real business or they have the risk of that business going under or if they're lucky and they have some great technology, they'll probably get bought out. But I think we're still about six to nine months away from real possibility for consolidation, be it in India or be it in Silicon Valley or be it in anywhere to be fair in the startup ecosystem around the world. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll, I'll ask you my last question, Nikesh. Uh, it's about you as an individual. What's your mantra? How do you keep yourself charged up, you know, running a multinational corporation? You know, uh, uh, there are a lot of young people here in the room, you know. What's your guidance to them, you know, how to stay mentally, physically fit and, you know, prepare for the uncertain world? Um, Harish, uh, you know, I'm getting older. So the young people, the problem is I, I'm supposed to come to India next weekend and do the graduation speech at Banaras in the university. And I've been spending a lot of time thinking about how do you give advice to young people? I can see there's an ample amount of older people in the room as well as younger people in the room. And all of us slightly older people have a lot more experience. The risk is if you start talking from our experience, all the young people think we're old people and we don't know anything uh, because young people have to go experience life themselves to reach that experience. So I think. Part of what the younger people have to do, they have to take risks, 
uh, and not listen to us because if they listen to us, we'll probably you know, risk manage them away. So my only advice to young people is get up in the morning if you feel really excited about something, go out and do it, take a shot, see if it works. If it doesn't work, just make sure you're resilient and you get punched in the face, you go back to bed, you wake up in the morning and you try something again. If we, they started listening to all of us older people about what we're telling them, they probably will just go back to bed and say it's not going to work anyway because Nikkei said half the time this stuff doesn't work or perhaps half the older people in the room told their kids that this thing's not going to work. So I think the reason we live in a highly dynamic, disruptive world, a highly entrepreneurial world is because somebody younger than us comes out and says, let me show these guys how I can change the world. Let me show these guys what they don't know. And very often they do, right? If if young people hadn't started Uber or Ola or Oyo or pick your favorite Indian company or Baiju's, you'd all told them, are you crazy? Do you think people are going to sit home and watch videos and learn and get education? Do you think you're crazy that a cab driver is going to show up because you text him or you have a phone which tells you where you are? So all that stuff, which we could have told them to rationalize away, would have not been built. So my only advice to young people is take risks, understand the risks, make sure if you get punched in the face, reiterate, innovate, and get up again. And then when you get as old as us, you'll tell people what not to do. Thank you, Nikesh. I think this is really, really sound advice. With that, we would take your leave and we would wish you good night. We know it's very late over there, nearly uh, 11 o'clock in the night. Thank you so much for taking out time to talk to us. Uh, you know, and I, and I think I'm, I'm sure all of us would like to talk to you soon at a given opportunity. Thank you and good night. Thank you, Arish, and thank you, everyone, for listening. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mr. Nikesh and Mr. Agarwal. Uh, I just request you to stay on stage for some time, and I'll request Mr. Pradipta Biswash, CFO of AVP Private Limited, to kindly come on stage to present a memento to Mr. Harish and to Mr. Anil Valuri. He is the MD and Regional Vice President of Palo Alto. May I request you to kindly come forward to receive the Memento on behalf of Mr. Nikesh. And here is Mr. Pradipta Biswa, CFO, ABP Private Limited, presenting a memento to Mr. Anil Valuri. He is the MD and Regional Vice President of Palo Alto on behalf of Mr. Nikesh. And here is uh, Mr. Pradipta Biswas presenting a memento to Mr. Harish Agarwal. Thank you so much for this very interesting session. A big round of applause, please. Thank you, and we request you to take your seats in the auditorium. Ladies and gentlemen, in a short while from now, that is in exactly maybe 40 minutes from now, we will be starting with our inaugural session. So we will just take a little break so that we can do the preparations for the arrival of the governor. And in the meanwhile, you can have your tea, you can sit around here, we're going to have a little interaction if uh, all of you are willing to do that. And uh, we will come back and we will start with the session at 12.30. Thank you. <laughs>